uh, first, before we begin, I really encourage you while taking this webinar to actively track your body's response to the content. Uh, if you're new to tracking your body's responses, I think a really easy way to do that is by starting to um, tracking your breathing. Is it slow? Is it fast? Uh, where is it flowing towards? Also, uh, some folks mentioned this, and if you tend to experience a lot of dissociation, I encourage you to get really, really cozy. I even have a blanket of my own that I'm wrapping myself in today because it's getting a little bit chillier. But uh, it also might help you to hold something soft like a blanket or stuffed animal or to give yourself some kind of soothing self-touch. So, so the subject that we're talking about today is, of course, um, what is whiteness really? So why I believe it's important to know what whiteness is, that it really holds the key to racism cessation because it gives us a really foundational kind of understanding of what is the thing that we're actually dealing with. So in kind of thinking about what whiteness is, I think there's a lot of answers that are, that are out there. So for example, whiteness is a system of oppression. Uh, it's a way of thinking. It's a type of culture. It's maybe a set of behavior patterns. And an obvious one, it might be understood as a skin color. At the same time, I didn't find these answers necessarily satisfy me in a way that was really fulfilled me. So even though a lot of these answers kind of resonated as had, having truths, I felt for myself somewhere that they didn't address the whole picture of whiteness really is. So today, we're, I think I'd like to explore like my kind of proposal. I'm not saying this is the final uh, vision of whiteness, but maybe something a little bit more pulled out and maybe even just something new to add to the conversation about what whiteness is. So in understanding what whiteness is, I think it's really um, interesting to kind of refer back to, there's a Buddhist um, kind of parable, a story. And this is, this, describe, this is a picture of the kind of like story. So um, this, this is a Japanese print by Hokusai, but there's also many other visual iterations of the story. And it's essentially about, about um, some people who can't see trying to describe what and uh, what is the sh what an elephant is so depending on part of the body they're touching all the people are describing hey the elephant is actually a snake or the elephant is a stick or the elephant is a thick wall or the elephant is a hairball and when we talk about whiteness i think this is one of the things that happens is that depending on how on the lens that we're looking at, whiteness seems to be made up of different things. So it's hard to get to what the whole picture is. And so in, in addressing this aspect of understanding whiteness, and uh, I mean, a lot of like, actually a lot of other um, vocabulary and social justice are started to think about like the difference between allopathy and what you would call holistic medicine. So, Allopathy, uh, which is another name for Western medicine, tends to focus on symptoms. So outcomes of things that are, have ca root causes. On the other hand, holistic medicine, uh, for example, uh, Asian or Chinese, Chinese medicine, which is related to energies, focuses on causes. So in exploring kind of these, a lot of things were up in my life when I, was kind of exploring these ideas, but I started asking myself, like, you know, especially as part of my own decolonizing process, what would Asian, medicine, Asian energy medicine say about whiteness? And then it came to, you know, it kind of landed on me as a really obvious answer, especially reading um, a lot of uh, Japanese texts about um, about Western culture. I, it's hard for me to give credit to all of them here. First, nobody will probably know what these texts are. Nobody can read them. But there's also so many little blog posts here and there from martial arts journals to texts. But I just wanted to kind of give a credit to the body of work that's kind of developed in Japan around understanding uh, Western culture. But 
when you really look at what would Asian energy medicine say about whiteness, it's essentially that like any other dis-ease, which I certainly believe whiteness is, it's an imbalance, imbalance of energy created by stuckness in the body. It's quite simple. It shouldn't really, there's no reason why whiteness should be any different than uh, let's say how we might develop a cold or even um, other uh, conditions that are strongly related to stuckness of energies in the body, let's say cancer as an illness. There's no actual reason necessarily to to ha like understand those things differently, which I thought was a really interesting idea. And so this kind of like led me to an exploration of this idea that whiteness is actually an embodied energetic imbalance. So it's actually a lot more or on a different level, it's, it's not just a color of skin or a type of culture. It's, it's very specifically an imbalanced embodiment that creates a certain set of, certain set of ideas and attitudes in the world. So to understand what I mean by whiteness being an energetic imbalance, I think it's really helpful to, for everybody to get on the same page as me about the basics of energy medicine and its relationship to modern neuroscience. So in the next little bit, we're gonna go through um, the basics of energetic embodiment. It's mainly taken from Chinese and Asian energy medicine. I am Japanese, but Chinese energy medicine has a huge impact in a lot of Asia. So it comes through um, energy medicine as well as martial arts. So the kind of anatom anatomical understandings that Chinese medicine uses is very common to the rest of Asia. So I kind of expand the idea. It's, it's a little bit fluid. So if you have experience in things like Tai Chi, Qi Gong, Aikido, um, as well as a little bit going back into something like South Asian uh, medicine, you'll, you, I think you'll notice a lot of the threads that I'm using, or resourcing, sorry. So in Chinese energy medicine, there's, there's, a, con there's a concept about there being three main energy centers in the body that are referred to as the three, three Danxians. So if you see their location, they also line up to a little, roughly to some of the chakras within a seven chakra system. So the Danxians, there's three of them. Uh, first one is a lower Danxian, which sits a little bit underneath the navel inside the body. Then the middle Danxian, which is in the middle of the chest, um, right above the solar plexus, uh, closer to, close to the heart and lungs. And the upper Danxian corresponds roughly to the third eye location inside the body. So in, you know, more towards, I would say, to the back of the brain as opposed to the front. And with each Danxian has a different function. So I like to use the three H's. So there's one, the head. So the relationship to the abstract is the function of the head, otherwise known as the intellect. Uh, the middle Danxian, otherwise known as the heart, is the relationship to others, otherwise known as empathy. And then Hara is a Hara is actually a Japanese term, so I'm not using Danxian here, but um, Hara and Danxian are also the same thing, but I like to use Hara because it's ancestral to my language, but also it's neat because it makes it all H's. But Hara is our relationship to self. It's the center of sensation, is literally the center of the body in terms of gravity. And as we know, when we talk about um, gut instincts, it's also the center of our intuition. Hold on. Can you hold on one second? I'm the menu bar is slightly in my way. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So, sorry about that. I just had to adjust a little bit of my display. So, how we weight our self concept 
is intrinsically connected to how we relate to our energy centers. So if we think, if a person generally tends to think, I am my actual thoughts, then their weighting of their self-concept in the body goes towards their mind. So it would be more located at upper dantian. If somebody identifies with their feelings, which includes the feelings of other people they're experienced through empathy, their self-concept is going to tend to weight towards the heart. And if somebody is think, feeling that I am my experience, I am my sensations, I am my body, then their self-concept tends to weight towards the lower Dantian. So I think you already start to probably see how this relates to colonization is that essentially modern colonized Western society tends to identify self-concept with the head and the heart. So with thoughts and feelings. And pulling up an interesting fact, there's recent research that's revealing that the positions of these dentions are actually neural networks in our bodies, or aka brains, which are connected by the vagus nerve, uh, which runs along the spine, connecting the brain, the heart brain and the gut brain, and it plays a central role in regulation of the autonomic nervous system, which is responsible for our fight, flight, and freeze reactions. So in terms of how, um, how trauma affects our body, the interactions of our upper, middle, and lower Danshan has a huge impact on our nervous system. And if you're more, if you're interested more in more detail about learning about, um, let's say about the vagus nerve or about um, those three different brains, although polyvagal theory sometimes doesn't get to all of it, I think it's a great place to start. Uh, for the context of this, Webinar, though, will be sticking with a more energy medicine-based explanation and exploration. This is simply because I think staying within energy medicine, it's a little bit easier to work with in visualization. Whereas when we start to learn about the different functions uh, in terms of nerves, it's going to be a little bit, it's, it's going to, we're going to have a little bit more distance, I think, from being able to work with our own nervous system ourselves. So we're going to stay in energy medicine, but if you're really interested, and I really encourage uh, more research in that area by anybody, is to uh, read up uh, more on polyvagal theory. And I'm also really happy to, you know, uh, continue discussion about polyvagal theory in the coaching group, uh, in the Facebook group as well. So getting back to the main subject, um, when you actually look at many Asian cultures, um, including South Asia and all the way to Japan, as well as, um, uh, as yeah, as well as everything, every other place in between, the lower dungeon or Hara is commonly understood to be the most important of the three energy centers. And the reason why is it because it grounds our sense of self in the present in our experience in the body. So when we are centered in Hara, we are understood being a true expression of self and an inherent harmony with the universe. And so where you can kind of start to see images um, in Asian spiritual practice, for example, uh, on, your, on the left side, you see Siddhartha, um, which is the Buddha sitting in a, a meditative position. And I, I think you can already, see, even though there's a halo around his head, I feel, I think it's really obvious to any viewer that when you start seeing the energy of how his body is aligned, there's a very strong grounding and centering in the lower body. Um, also, when you look to the right, there's um, an older Asian gentleman practicing some form of Chinese martial arts. And you also see in his posture, there is a certain kind of groundedness into the belly area. So another interesting fact, um, in evolution, the gut brain, which is the hara, is actually the first brain that formed. So when you actually think about the body, it's actually just one big digesting tube, and it still is. So even though modern neuroscience tends to think of the gut brain as a second brain, it is actually the first brain in evolution. So Proceeding on, um, how is it that our nervous systems are affected by our energies? So this is a very kind of simple explanation. And again, if you 
learn more about polyvagal theory and the interaction between the heart brain, the gut brain, and the, and the head brain, I don't know what else to call it at this point because they're all brains, is um, you can read up more about it. Uh, and it certainly can become more complex than this. But this is a really simple way, I think, to break it down is that essentially when our nervous systems become overactivated, a lot of hot or active, active energy is sent upwards in our body. So that means that um, we might become overly rational, we can become emotionally entangled with other people, we start stop knowing what we, what we want for ourselves, and we are more easily triggered into fight, flight, and freeze. So in the diagram here, you see that um, and the, you know, the upper body is red and the lower body is blue, indicating a kind of uh, emptiness and, and the upper body being full. Also knowing here that emptiness is, emptiness in this context has a kind of content, connotation from Buddhism. It doesn't mean that there's not nothing there, but that there, there is an energy of a certain kind of passiveness. So in contrast to this, we are most effective we are most effective when we are actually centered in our hara and feel fuller in our lower body. So that would mean that our hot or active energy tends to be centered in hara and lower in our body and there's more cool, empty and calm energy in our upper body. So when, when we are in this embodiment, we tend to be more cool headed. We are able to be empathetic and passionate, but we're not led by our emotions. We are more relaxed, yet we have a lot of energy, and we can certainly tune into our own needs, and we are less triggered into fight, flight, and freeze responses. So what is it that makes it hard for us to be centered in Hara in our gut brain? And the answer uh, is from trauma. And the reason why is because when we are centered in hara, which is a lower abdomen, we become aware of our body as a whole. So in muscular anatomy, when we are centered in hara, it'll release our spine, as well as our iliopsoas, which connects our upper and lower bodies. And this lets us to move fluidly and sense our whole body. So um, on the right, you see where the iliopsoas muscle is. It connects the lower part of your spine through your um, pelvis bones into your the upper part of your legs. So this muscle is actually a really important muscle in terms of working with trauma in the body because if you know fight, flight, and freeze responses are all different types of movement and a lot of information around trauma becomes stored there or at least reflected through there because fight and flight Obviously, you need this iliopsoas muscle needs to be highly activated to take on those actions, as well as if you freeze, this part has to lock up. So when we, the hara, if you can visualize, actually kind of sits right above the pubic bone, right? So when we're centered there, that whole area starts to become a lot more free. And because of this, it's actually very hard for us if we have experienced a lot of trauma in our lives to be in Hara. And this is because, um, you know, when you experience trauma, you essentially have memories and images and behaviors stored in different parts of your body and, and different energy. Um, I would consider it like, um, I feel like the best way maybe to describe it as like if our body is a hard disk, so it looks like a piece of vinyl. It's like a huge piece of like a record, like an LP. And then there's a scratch on it. And so when you play that part of the scratch, it keeps looping and looping and looping like it, you would in a record. So trauma stores these behaviors, images, and memories in different parts of our body. And that means if the closer we get to Hara, the closer we get centered in our guts and our enteric nervous system and Hara, we start to, those areas start to unravel and release. So 
And that's also, that's also why when we experience trauma, our activated energy leaves our belly and tends to stay in our upper body because trauma makes it painful for us to experience our body as a whole, which is a necessary aspect of being centered in our gut. So when you look at this, you start to see that all healing um, that is physical and uh, spiritual is a process of realigning our energies so that we are self-concept can become located back in Hara. So below you see a diagram of what may happen when your energies leave Hara. It's, it's very difficult to relax and you tend to stay in an activated state. Your heart rate tends to be up and your breathing might be fast. Of course, um, if you have a freeze response, if something different will happen, but again, we're using a really simplified model. And if we're really to tease out the different ways our nervous systems respond, we'd probably have to get into a lot more of a complex modeling. So I'm just going to leave it kind of here, but of course we can tease this more out, uh, especially in, in the community calls where we can do more like deep embodied work where we can sense into our own bodies. Um, we'll pick that. But I think the basic understanding that uh, is useful is that, you know, again, it makes trauma makes it difficult for us to be centered into Hara because that will activate our whole body's awareness of the pain that it holds. So the question, I guess, now probably is how do we understand whiteness in relationship to energetic embodiment? And how does all this conversation of Hara relate back to whiteness? So, um, in doing a lot of research around the subject, um, there was a wealth of material, um, especially from uh, Japanese thinkers and writers around, the, you know, who do a lot of analyzing around um, embodiment cultures from around the world. And something I, I stumbled on was that idea that. Um, Essentially, white culture and lifestyle, and I'm talking about modern Western white culture, it exemplifies the energy, energetic effects of trauma. And if you look at what colonized lifestyle looks like, it tends to send energy upwards in the body and disconnect us from our lower body. So below you kind of see, let's say, an image of the um, modern suit. Um, the pants are, tend to be tight. They're cinching in the waist. The heart area is expanded. Um, on the left of you see, um, I think these are German soldiers marching. You see in their uniform and the way they march, their ener energy is being sent upwards into the body. Uh, to the right, again, there's chairs. Uh, chairs are also a, a very much an aspect of Western culture. They're not necessarily as common pre-colonial lifestyle. Also, the seated toilet. I know everybody thinks that's probably really funny, but if you think about the importance of Hara as our, as our gut and our digestive system and how that's connected, you start to see like the reason, like, you know, people used tended to squat around the world until the introduction of the Western toilet. So you can definitely see there's a connection there. Um, here is a, uh, the corset of I think, Marie Antoinette. You can definitely see this uh, very uh, whiteified uh, body image of this super cinched waist. So essentially, that would mean that the hara would be extremely constricted, as well as the you know the modern modern uh, white male um, archetype of the hard abs as being the most desirable. The abs also being hard, not allowing room and sensation and supple awareness of the lower abdomen. So what's interesting is when you actually start to look at pre-colonial lifestyles, the lifestyle itself is actually much, much closer to the earth. So on, on the left upper hand, you see uh, women doing a, a, I think it's a Ghanaian um, uh, dance. You can see the posture is much lower to the ground. In the center, uh, there's South Asian children seated on the ground eating with their hands. But, you know, you, again, you see the absence of chairs to the right upper side. An old man, an uh, old Chinese man is doing, um, doing horse dance for Kung Fu. And you have a Japanese monk on the left bottom side, uh, again, seated on the ground. 
as well as on the right bottom, um, uh, indigenous peoples doing uh, their grass dance. You can also see there kind of how they hold their posture. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip back so you can kind of get to see a little bit that the comparison between what we understand as white modern culture and, and you know, especially cultures of color, um, pre-colonial, and you see how the pre-colonial traditions speak to a much, di much different type of self-concept. So, again, in summary, uh, the what whiteness to me really is is a certain kind of embodiment that sends energy into the heart and brain and is inherently rigid, reactive, and disassociated since it is, the hara becomes empty. So when the hara becomes empty, there is um, more activation, uh, there's less awareness of self, and less awareness of the body as a whole. So in understanding this, if I can summarize, uh, what does all this mean? Um, and you know what does it mean to really work with whiteness in this context of energy medicine so you know how do we decolonize and how do we secede racism and what does that what does that work for white people well i think the most important foundational piece of this if you follow chinese medicine is that it's about healing the impacts of whiteness on the healing the impacts of whiteness on the bodies of white people which means uh, restoring hara and realigning uh, the energies of the body and when that also means actually white people knowing their true nature because hara essentially is an under a very intuitive understanding of the true nature of self.